bitterness. Being bitter against yourself. I think that in also encompasses unforgiveness towards yourself. Many people go through life and they can't forgive themselves because of things that they've done or things that they've said or things that have happened to them and they believe it's their fault that these things happen to them. And if you have those things, it can literally not only bring a spiritual bondage, but it can also bring physical illnesses. We've researched that and found that even in medical journals that tell you about stress and anxiety and how that opens the door to many, many physical, uh, 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 um, many physical uh, abnormalities in your body. You know what stress can cause? It can cause headaches. It can cause neck aches, back aches. It can cause a lot of different physical ailments. Anxiety and stress can also be one of the things that can elevate your blood pressure your cholesterol. There's so many things that it can affect. And uh, at the end of this course, if you're interested in the, a couple of books, I'll give you the titles. I'll have them up on the screen for you that you can order. Um, and it, he's, he goes right through every single disease. And he says, it, it could be this or it could be that or it could be this. So you need to renounce this. You need to renounce that. You need to renounce this. We'll get through those things. Self-bitterness. Always looking down on yourself. Never feeling like you're living up to the standard all the time. I specifically chose that last song tonight, He's a Good, Good Father, because our outcomes sometimes of our Heavenly Father is a result of what our earthly father put us through. And if we're not careful, we can allow some of those emotions and those feelings of, a, of aloofness from God because of the aloofness from our, our physical fathers. But God is not like our physical fathers. Amen? He's a good, good father. You know, so many times we think God is up there with a bat waiting for us to make a mistake so he can just clunk us on the head and say, why did you do that? And yelling and screaming at us. God's not doing that. God, God says, whatever you sow, you reap. So a lot of times God is there like a heavenly father, like, a, like, a, like someone who cares and loves about you and, and, and loves you and wants the best for you and sees you go through these things and then you begin to... Re, you, you begin to uh, uh, reap what you've sown because of disobedience, because of uh, not wanting to follow God's, word, God's voice, or you have unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is one of the biggest things that cause people's uh, growth in spiritually to be stunted. They, can, they don't grow anymore because they have a lot of this bitterness and a lot of this anger and a lot of this uh, resentment and unforgiveness. And so we have to deal with those things, especially when it comes to self. So we'll be talking about a couple of these tonight. Uh, I don't know if we'll get that far with the next one, which is jealousy and envy. Jealousy and envy. And it goes like this. I don't understand. I tithe, I give, and so-and-so is getting more blessed than me. <laughs> Why is so-and-so getting more blessed than me? I don't understand that. I don't understand why everything works out for them and nothing works out for me. <clears throat> so we become envious and jealousy. Somebody gets a new car, oh, we, 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 we have to get a new car. Okay, if someone gets something, we have to get something. It's almost like a competition going back and forth. And, and you know how it is, you know, and, and what happens is when those things begin to settle in, it can cause some, some real negativity in our thoughts. The fourth one is a really big one, and it's really a cause of a lot of, lot of issues in our life. It's rejection. It's rejection. Now, if I was to ask you to raise your hand if you've ever been rejected, I bet you mostly everyone in this room will raise their hand. Somewhere in your life, you've been rejected, whether it's a father, a mother, a sister, a brother, a, a, a peer at work, or a teacher at school. Somewhere down the line, uh, a, a relationship, uh, maybe when you were dating, the, the girl or the boy uh, left you and decided not to date you anymore and left you, and you, you were rejected. Um, 
Sometimes people feel that way and feel that God has rejected them. And always remember this one thing. God never rejects anyone. It's the person that rejects God. It's the person that turns away from God. God is always there. He says, all manner of sin is forgiven, except, of course, we understand blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. But other than that, for every sin that we've committed, God says, I'm there to love you, to care for you, to provide for you, to give you what you need in life. He's the, he's the sustainer of life. He's the giver of life. He is life. And he came so that you and I could have life and life more abundantly. And that's not more cars, more money, more homes. That's not, no, that you could have the, fulfill, the fulfillness of life, the fulfillness of life in knowing that you're obeying God and moving in the directions that, for your life that God has for you. Amen? Rejection is a very, very, very strong negative emotion. Very strong. Because of rejection, a lot of times, people will um, become isolated. Uh, people will become um, very uh, bitter. Uh, uh, they're, they're, lo they're loners. They don't want to be involved with anybody else. They don't want to get hurt anymore, so they don't get involved, so they... They become isolated. They become uh, almost hermits, like in their home. They don't want to be bothered with anybody because of rejection. <clears throat> they don't want people to see them and the things that they're doing. And so what happens is rejection sets in, and, and then, then the thoughts come, well, nobody cares, nobody loves me, God doesn't love me anymore. That's the furthest thing from the truth. But that's what some of these feelings and emotions will cause in your heart and in your life. The next one is fear. Fear. I like to say it this way, fear, F-E-A-R. Fear. False evidence appearing real. F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real. Many times, things that we fear and we worry about never happen. I can't go. What if this happens? And everybody goes and nothing happens. <laughs> and so you miss out in life because of fear. Oh, I don't know if I can drive that far. Oh, oh if I drive that far, what could happen to me? Or you could be driving around the corner and a trail truck could hit you <laughs> right near your house. So false evidence appearing real sometimes. Uh, the devil will come and try to tell you, oh, don't do this, don't do that. You know, don't get too close to Jesus because if you get too close to Jesus, you know, you're going to flip out. You're not going to flip out. Negative thoughts involving the occult. That's the next one. And actually, there's seven. There's one that I've, I stuck in there, I, that's, that, that's stuck in there. Um, but the occult is the demonic. Um, I don't know if you saw that on Facebook about the Christian Witches Conference. It's, it's a woman who's an ordained minister who is claiming to be a Christian and a witch, and they're having their, an, they're having their annual conference in Salem, Massachusetts, April something or other. Uh, I got an alert on that. And it just, it just boggles your mind. Where are they, who is she listening to? She's not listening to the Spirit of God. It's just another trapping. But for people that are weak in the Word and don't know the Word, um, and I believe all of this that's starting to happen is happening for a purpose and a reason to get everybody ready for the Antichrist. The false miracles, the false signs, the false wonders, people that look to those things to validate truth rather than looking to the word to validate truth. Because there's going to be false miracles, signs, and wonders. You're going to be amazed, that, if we're still here, at some of the miracles that will take place. And so um, that's uh, one of the areas we're going to be talking about of negative thought. Another one is long-term grief. Long-term grief. It's 
someone, someone has hurt, uh, died or someone that you have lost someone in your life and you're constantly grieving over that. Now, I remember um, when I was in India a few, a few years ago, uh, I think it was my first trip to India, uh, I met a sister and she had, I think, two or three children. I don't remember, two, I think. And uh, she was very sad. And so I asked the missionary why she was so sad. He says, well, her husband was a Hindu and he died. And um, now no one will touch her. No one will marry her because she's unclean. Think about that. So she was sad because of the tradition of her uh, culture that she lived in, even as a Christian, and was taught that now that you have children and you've been married before, you can't marry ever again. And uh, I told her, I, through an interpreter, I said, Sister, I said, I'm going to read you what the Bible says. If a husband dies, you may go be another, another um, man's wife, only in the Lord, it says. I said, but see, the tradition in your culture makes the word of God of none effect. Long-term grief, and I've noticed that also amongst the Italians and the Portuguese, right? Someone dies, they wear black the rest of their life. They're in mourning the rest of their life. Why? Because they believe that if they wear anything else, that it's, 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 a, it's a plight on that person that died. It shows them that they didn't care. No, you, you love that person. You were with that person. You married that person. Whatever it was, or your mom or your dad, that doesn't show any disrespect at all. But what happens is, is that your life becomes so involved in that thing, and you're living in that grief. And God says, he doesn't want you to live in that grief. So these are all things that we're going to be talking about. Next slide. How do we deal with negative thoughts? What's some of the things that we can do with these negative thoughts? 2 Corinthians 10, 4 to 5. I'm using the Amplified because it really gives a really good, strong definition there. It says, the weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood. So let's stop there for a moment. This particular portion of Scripture is dealing with the thoughts in your mind. Now understand that thoughts come from three places. It comes from God, comes from yourself, and comes from the enemy. Right? Those are the three places. And you must discern or have the discernment exercised or used to know the difference. In other words... You've got all these people that believe they are Christian and yet are witches. Yet they really believe that. They very strongly believe that. However, the reason why they believe that is because they don't discern. They don't have the spiritual uh, capacity to discern biblical truth. So he says here, the weapons of our warfare... You're in a war. If the devil can drive you crazy, he will. <laughs> okay. One, a person told me one time, they said, oh, man, the devil's driving me crazy. I said, why are you letting him behind the wheel? Don't let him drive. How do you get in the car in the first place? You must have opened the door, handed him the keys. The weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood. In other words, it's not the natural. It's not psychology. It's not counseling, although those things can help and they're good. It's not medication. Those things can help and they're good. But you're fighting a spiritual battle for your soul. Twenty-four-seven. 24-7, you're in a battle. Even when you sleep. Anyone ever have nightmares? Anyone ever dream that demons are attacking them in their sleep? Huh? 
what ends up happening? Sometimes you can fight in the name of Jesus and they, they go away, and sometimes what happens? You wake up. But our weapons are divinely powerful. Look at that. Divinely powerful. For a purpose. What's the purpose? For the destruction of fortresses. The enemy sometimes will, will put things in our minds and will think certain things, and it becomes a fortress. It becomes a place for these entities. And you remember the seven things that I told you about when you have unforgiveness, you have unforgiveness. Then what? You didn't write the seven things down? Huh? Huh? Right. If you don't take care of one thing, unforgiveness, then a stronger stronghold begins to build that fortress in your, in your mind and you begin to have resentment. And then after resentment is what? Retaliation. Boy, that person's going to get their, theirs. Someday, I don't know when, but someday they're going to get theirs. You begin to have resentment in your heart and in your mind. So then that, that spirit of resentment comes in and begins to be a part of that fortress, that stronghold. All because you won't forgive. That's why forgiveness is so important. And then after resentment comes what? Huh? Retaliation. I'm going to go by their house and I'm going to flatten all their tires tonight. Okay? But do you understand what I'm saying? Now, retaliation is an even stronger hold because now it's motivating you to do something bad. All because those other two things have not been taken care of through forgiveness. And do you see who it's really ruining? It's not ruining the, the people and the persons and the cir circumstances and situations. It's ruining you. It's ruining me. So after resentment comes retaliation. After retaliation comes what? Anger. Then you get angry. You don't get righteously angry, right? Now, I know some of you never did this. You got so angry that you picked something up and threw it against the wall. <laughs> or threw something down. Or broke something. Come on. You had an outburst of anger. The Bible says, let not the sun go down on your anger. Be angry and sin not. The Bible says, give no place to the devil. Do you know how you give place to the devil? Through anger. When you get angry, somebody says something or somebody does something or someone threatens you, and you get angry and you don't deal with those other thing, issues in your life because that's the progression when you get to anger and you don't deal with that anger, you know what happens? It motivates you to go and settle it. You, you call me what? I'll be right there. <laughs> okay? And you want to go take care of it. After anger comes hatred. Right? Is that the next one? What was the one that, uh, what was the emotion that Cain showed? Huh? Huh? 
But what, what was the last one we just did? Anger. And then what was after that? Why do we know that Cain had hatred toward Abel? Yes, sir. We know that Cain had hatred toward Abel. Hatred, his own brother. Because he killed him. Hatred comes before murder. He allowed his emotions and his feelings to go unchecked and undealt with See, but yet he was religious. He brought his offering of the fruit of the ground. But when God accepted the offering from Abel, but didn't accept Cain's offering, he got a spirit of unforgiveness, a spirit of resentment. All seven of them. And because he didn't check them and get, get his heart right with it, he could have. He could have got all of that stuff right with God, but he chose by his free will not to do it. And he allowed that to escalate all the way up to hatred, and then from hatred it turned into murder. That was the fortress. That was the stronghold. And he goes, by doing this, our weapons being divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses, we are destroying, look, look at this, we are destroying sophisticated arguments. So you've got these sp spirit entities that are talking in your mind saying, you don't forgive, don't you ever forgive that person. That person doesn't deserve your forgiveness. Look what they did to you. So you, they, they come up with these sophisticated arguments in your brain and saying, if you do that, you're a fool, you're a joke. How can you forgive that person for what they've done? And what happens is they begin to uh, have this dialogue, if you will, or these arguments. But God says, no, he's, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortunes. For we are destroying sophisticated arguments. You're going to see how to do that. And every exalted and proud thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought and purpose captive. Hallelujah. To the obedience of Christ. Each and every one of us, we need to be disciplined. I know a lot of people don't like that word, but you need to be disciplined in your thinking. Casting down, the King James says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ, bringing it into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So you're going into a store and you buy something, and it costs you $5, we'll say. And you hand the person a $20 bill. And they, in return, give you change for a $50 bill. You don't go out of the store rejoicing that God just blessed you. <laughs> okay? Because what will happen is your conscience will kick in, but the thought will be there. I remember Linda and I, we had gone shopping for something. Do you remember what that was? We went shopping for something and that we didn't get paid. Was it a vitamin or something? I forget what it was, but it, it was something that we noticed when we came out of Stop and Shop, they didn't charge us for. Because Linda's a slip monger. You know, she always goes through the slip. You know, she's got to go through the slip every time. So she'll go through the slip, and she goes hey, that item's not on here. They didn't charge us for that. So we're already outside. We're almost to the car. And there's a voice that speaks to your conscience and says, ah, just forget about it. Get in the car. Go home. It's their mistake. 
Ever have that happen to you? But then there's another thought that comes in your mind. That's not right. So Linda and I, we go back in the store and we go to the the same checkout we went to, and we said, excuse me, yes, yes, sir, yes, sir. Um, on our slip, this item, you didn't charge us for it. And they look at you like you're weird. They're like, why did you come back? Why? Because your character and your integrity is in, is in jeopardy at that point. Are you who you say you are when no one's looking? Are you a Christian, follower of Christ, when no one's looking? These are thoughts that come into your brain. You have to take authority over them. When a thought comes in your brain and, and says to you, you know, you're, you're a failure. You're not going to amount to anything. What do you do? Oh, yeah, I guess I'm a failure. Yep, I guess I'm not going to amount to anything. You start going into a self-pity party, and then the devil presses more and more and presses more and more and presses more and more, so you get so stressed out that you have to relieve that stress somehow. Hello? No, that's not what God wants you to do. This is your life. This is my life. You're only going to have one life. And God says he wants you to enjoy this life Abundantly. Not in material things, but having the thought and the heart and the relationship with God that you know that when you don't do a certain thing that the enemy comes and tempts you to do, that you're, you're pleasing God's heart. You're pleasing your Father. You conquered. You made a victory. Praise God. Take me on to another victory. Hallelujah. So what are we to do? What are we to do with these negative thoughts that come into our, our minds and our hearts? The next slide will say this. Philippians 4, 8 to 9. It says, finally, believers, whatever is true, I want to stop there because that's important. Whatever is true. If the devil comes, even through people, people you love, relationships that you have with people, relatives, loved ones, and they come and tell you, oh, you're this and you're that and, and you're this and you're that because they want to control you and the devil wants to get at you through them. Hello? Hello? He says, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, you know, when you do something good and you're honored for it, they give you a, either a, 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 a plaque or something like that, or they, they honor you in front of people and they, 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 you, you save someone's life and then the, the, the mayor gives you an, a great honor of, a, of, a, of a, a declaration from the State House in Boston with your name on it, and they recognize you as a hero for doing something. You're honored. Whatever is honorable and worthy of respect, whatever is, look at this, right and confirmed by God's word. We're going to get into some of these things, hopefully. <laughs> it's going a lot slower than I thought. It's already almost five past eight. Whatever is pure and wholesome, whatever is lovely and brings peace, whatever is admirable and of good repute, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise... He says to do what? Think continually on these things. Stop thinking about how awful you are. <laughs> I already know how awful we are. We already know that in this flesh dwells no good thing.
But we need to stop that. Remember the three things I said from the beginning of the seminar, what we needed to do, have? What was that? What was the first one? Courage. You've got to, have an, you've got to, be, you've got to be courageous to be able to face the things that are in your heart and in your spirit that need to go. Second, you've got to have strength. You've got to have the strength to face these things and not, not give up. Because what will happen is as God begins to get deeper into your heart and examining your heart, what's going to happen is you'll have that, that response of either fight or flight. You've seen people like that. You begin to touch an area of their life. and you know, you know, Sometimes you don't even know it. You're in a conversation. And yet you go into an area and you go, oh, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. Ah, ah. That's the flight. But then... A lot of times, the flight can also be this. I can't let anybody know about those things because if they do, they'll not love me anymore. And that's the furthest from the truth. God knows all about those things already, and he loves you. And the third thing was what? Truthfulness or honesty. Being honest with yourself not pretentious, not thinking I've got to put on this image so people can see me, but at home I'm a different person. At home, I'm not who you see in church. No. You're only fooling yourself. So he says you take these thoughts into captivity and then you think continual on these things, center your mind on them, look what it says, and implant them in your heart. How are you going to do that if you don't read God's word? How are you going to implant that in your heart? How are you going to think continually on those things if God's word is getting more dust on it, sitting on your table, the amount of dust on your Bible is the amount of dust on your heart. And you wonder why things ain't working out. And you wonder why things don't turn out right for you. It's because, and I'm speaking to those watching too, it's because you're not disciplined. Implant them in your heart. The things which you have, what? Learned what you're learning here tonight about facing these issues, facing these things, not running away from them, being able to deal with them, knowing that you have a heavenly father that already knows all about it. And if he has servants that are really listening to his voice, they're not going to run from, away from you either. You know, I think it's in Proverbs, as a... Uh, about a, a friend sticketh closer than a brother. When you have somebody that loves you and knows everything that's going on in your life, but yet still loves you, don't put a plight against God and say, God, nobody loves me. That's a lie. He says, the things which you have learned, and what's this word right here? I can stand up here all day and offer this to you, but if you don't receive it, if you don't come and take it, if you don't grab a hold of it, it doesn't do you any good. I can give you my wallet full of money and say, I've got this for you, but unless you come and receive it, it's not going to benefit you. It's the same way with God's word. If you don't receive it, it's not going to benefit you. You can learn it. A lot of people learn it. But a lot of people don't receive it. They've got it up here. They can quote you scripture left and right. They haven't received it for themselves. You've got to receive it. Then what does it say? 
that which you have learned and you received and heard and seen in me. There, God will put people in your pathway as an example for you to follow. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the pastor. It can be a deacon. It can be a, a, a church goer. It doesn't have, it's someone that's following Christ, a sister, a brother, someone that you, you can depend on, someone that you can lean on, someone that you can turn to. But again, it takes courage, strength, and honesty, those three things, to develop a relationship. And if you don't have that in a relationship, you don't have anything. Especially with God, because he already knows everything. You know? Don't get frustrated that God knows everything. <laughs> Rejoice that God knows everything, and in spite of that, still loves you. Still loves me. Well, I don't understand that, Pastor. Well, it's not for you to understand. It's for you to believe it. Man, I'm not even getting through. Let's go to the next slide. That's the next slide? Okay. Isaiah 26.3 says, you will keep in perfect and constant peace. Let me ask you a question. How many need peace? Amen. We've got some honest people here. That's good. You want to, you want to be, have a peaceful life? God will keep you perfect and constant in peace, the ones whose mind is steadfast, that is committed and focused on you in both inclination and character. Because he trusts and takes refuge in you with hope and confident expectation. Are you confident with your relationship with God? Are you in the expectation from God? Or is he just some kind of far mystical uh, entity that's out there somewhere that doesn't really, really bother with you or have that interaction with you? The Bible says in King James, he will keep you, your mind in perfect peace as your mind is stayed upon him. Now, what does that mean, stay upon him? God, Jesus, God, Jesus, God. No, that doesn't mean that. Okay. With your mind is stayed upon him, meaning that as you're walking through your day, you're having conversation with him, like the first Adam had in the garden, because we have the second Adam, Jesus, that you can go boldly before the throne of grace to obtain grace and mercy in time of need. God gives you permission through the blood of Jesus to approach his holiness, well, otherwise, without the blood, we could never get close to God. But because of that relationship that we have, it's more than just the prayer. It's more than just a sinner's prayer that we say, but it's a relationship with our Heavenly Father through His Son that He has provided for us that we can go before this holy God, even in the carnality of our flesh and standing in our flesh, we can still see God. Not in its entirety, because the Bible says no man can see God and live. Not, in, the, not in, in his full revelation. That's why when Moses asked to see God, he said he put him in the cleft of the rock and he put his hand over him so he could just see the backside of him. And that was just a, what's called a theophany, where God just expressed a bit of himself. That wasn't all of who God was. God fills all the universe. You understand how immense God is? We put God in this little box. We think sometimes our troubles are bigger than God. <laughs> or our circumstances are bigger than God. God fills the entire universe. He's immense. He's everywhere present all at the same time. He can listen to billions upon billions upon billions of people and have that conversation personally with every single one at the same time. It's not like our husbands and wives. We can't only do one thing sometimes at one time. Some people can't drive and text at the same time. God can do all of that stuff. 
God can speak to you and speak to me and speak to you and speak to all over the world, speak to different parts of the world, all at the same time. Different subject matters. Do you understand the God that you serve? And he has chosen, God has chosen to love you. Now, that's what the word says. That's why you have to receive those things. Like it says, you learn and receive. Receive what God says about you. Let's go to the next slide. Well, I thought we'd get further than this. <laughs> well, Pastor, you know, we've done quite a few bad things in life. So have we all. Anyone here never do any bad things? Raise your hand. Any of you ever think bad things? Raise your hand. You never thought a bad thing. That's right. <clears throat> Look what it says here. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Holy Spirit, willingly, offered himself unblemished, that is, without more moral or spiritual imperfection, as a sacrifice to God, to cleanse your conscience. Do you ever feel guilty? He'll clean your conscience. Do you ever do anything wrong? You ask for forgiveness? He cleanses your conscience. How do I know if there's unforgiveness in my heart? We'll talk about that in a little bit. He will cleanse your conscience from dead works and lifeless observances to serve the ever-living God. So now you have to believe. You have to learn. You have to believe and you have to, you, you have to learn, you have to receive, and then you believe. You receive the truth, I receive it, Lord, I believe it. That's going to help you deal with the negativity and the thoughts that are bombarding your mind at different times in your life. Don't think for one moment that your life is worthless. It was for you that he came and died. You. It's for you. That's almost unfathomable. While we were yet sinners, it says, Christ died for us. Next slide, please. Forgiveness and repentance. Cancel Satan's legal rights over you. Well, my ex did this to me and did that to me. I'll never forgive him. Then you know what? The devil has every right to torment you. The devil has every right to put sickness on you. The devil has every right to cause you to doubt to fear, all the things that the enemy can bring, he'll bring it. That's why forgiveness is so important. Why do you think the Lord's Prayer was, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those? In other words, God won't forgive you if you're not willing to forgive others. And we're going to talk about those who will not forgive themselves. And I'll just interject this one thing. If you're a person who will refuse to forgive yourself, then you are your own God because God chooses to forgive you. And what you're saying is if you won't forgive, then you're God. And you're making your own rules. God forgives you. If you forgive people the trespasses, the reckless, willful sins, leaving them, leaving them, leaving them, letting them, what?
If you don't let them go, they stay. Hello? If you don't let them go, they're staying. Leaving them, letting them go, and what? Giving up resentment. Giving up resentment. You say, well, Pastor, how do, how do I know that I for, uh, you've forgiven somebody? It could be your mom. It could be your dad. It could be your life. It could be a wife. It could be an ex-wife. It could be a sister, a brother in Christ, whatever. How do you know when you've really forgiven? Is when that thought of that person or situation, there's no physical or emotional pain in it. If you have that thought, or uh, you're thinking of the, that situation or those circumstances in your life, and there's still pain in those, in those areas, you have not forgiven. Hello? Oh, pastor, it's hard. We're going to talk about that. Hopefully, I don't know how far we'll get. These are some of the other scriptures you can read. 1 John 1, 9, Ephesians 4, 26 to 27, and Matthew 18, 32 to 35. You can look those up. I'll repeat them again. 1 John 1, 9, Ephesians 4, 26 to 27, and Matthew 18, 32 to 35. Let's see, we've got time for one more slide. Unforgiveness. How does that start? Where's my, uh, my other sheet here? I lost it. Number one, unforgiveness is the primary root of bitterness. Unforgiveness is the primary root of bitterness. I want, I'll be repeating that so often through the seminar, you're going to get tired of hearing me say it because I want you to remember that. Unforgiveness is the primary root of bitterness. Unforgiveness keeps a record book of wrongs. I used to call it a file cabinet. Unforgiveness keeps a record book of wrongs. Someone that has wronged you, you know every single detail of what they did. You can say the day, the time, the hour, <laughs> okay, what they did, how they did it, If you are keeping a record book of wrongs, you have not forgiven. Unforgiveness number three reminds us of our faults. Unforgiveness will, re and this is also with unforgiveness towards yourself. You have unforgiveness towards yourself. Guess what? It's going to remind you of your faults. Forgiving yourself. Oh, man, I should have made that mistake five years ago. Oh, I should, I, and you're still beating yourself up for those mistakes, for those choices that you made. That shows you that you have unforgiveness towards yourself. Unforgiveness rehashes the past. It just keeps going over and over about the past. I can't believe it. La, 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 whatever that may be, with the situ situation or circumstance that happened in your life, you just rehash it over and over again in your mind. Why? 
because your mind is not steadfast on the, on the word. Like the Bible says, keep your mind steadfast on him, and he'll keep you in peace. You're letting these thoughts overcome you in your life. You're letting these thoughts overtake you in your life. And what's happening is, is that they're having damage in you for one simple reason. And understand this. The enemy has no power over you unless you believe his lies. The key for his entrance in, into your mind and into your spirit or into your, your thinking, into your soul, is he tell you a lie if you believe it. You're no good. Guess I'm no good. So then what happens? Now depression sets in. Come on. And all those seven things begin to take place toward you. Self-hatred. Look in the mirror, I hate myself. You know what you're saying to God when you do that? We're going to be talking about that, too. He projects, uh, unforgiveness projects failure and negative living from yesterday into today. Yesterday is the past. Today is the present. I told you about Changing your information base, changing your operation base, you get a different result. Where are you getting the information about yourself? Well, it's thoughts in my mind. Well, thoughts in your mind don't necessarily mean they're true. What does God think about you? See, if you're constantly failing and you're constantly living a failure as a Christian, the reason why is you haven't changed your information base. The devil is lying to you and causing you to stress out to turn to other things other than God. Because that becomes your God. You lean on those things and they become your Savior. They become your God. Those are the things that, that give you peace and relaxation till the next day. Hello? Hello? Your past becomes your present. And if you don't change it, it will become your future. Some people say, well, someday I'm going to be, I'll, be, I'll be get everything right. No, you won't. Unless you change your thinking. Unless you change the negative thoughts. Unless you stop thinking the way that you've been thinking and think the way God thinks about yourself. We're going to be talking about that. Unforgiveness torments us. Unforgiveness torments us. Next one, please. Unforgiveness torments us. <clears throat> Remember the story of the servant that owed his master money in the Bible? And the master came to collect, and the servant came, got on his knees before the master and said, God, you know, master, please forgive me. I don't have the money to, to pay you. Please don't take my children and my wife away from me. You know, I'll, I'll try to repay you the best I can. And it says that the master had compassion on him and forgave him all. He didn't, com he didn't forgive just part of the debt. He forgave the whole debt, right? Then he gets up. And he goes out in the street and he sees a guy that owes him five bucks. Okay? And he goes up to the guy, grabs him by the throat, starts choking at him and says, pay me what you owe me. And one of the workers of the master sees him, goes back, tells the master, and he calls him back. He says, you wicked servant. So I forgave you all of that debt, and you wouldn't forgive this man that debt. He says, throw him in jail till every price has been paid for that debt that he owes him. The Bible says that God sent the person that had unforgiveness torments. 
They were tormented. Read it. And then he says this, Likewise will your heavenly Father do unto you if you do not forgive from your heart. That's what the scripture says. Torment. Spirit of torment. <clears throat> it'll torment you. It'll, it'll drive you to do all kinds of things. Unforgiveness reminds us of how we have hurt others. Next. Reminds us of how we have hurt others. Again, not forgiving yourself for what things you have done. Reminds us of how we have hurt others. Well, I never hurt anybody. Yes, you have. The tongue is, can set up on hellfire, the Bible says. You can say things to people that can hurt them deeply. I hate you. I never want anything to do with you again. Get out of my life. You're no good. And sometimes we've been recipients of those things. Unforgiveness will remind us. <clears throat> Unforgiveness is quick, the next one, is quick to tell us why we should not forgive someone. It's quick to tell us why we should not forgive. I missed one, but that's okay. Reminds us of the times and circumstances and people involved when we were the victims, when people have done things to us. I can't believe they stole that from me. They said they were my friend, and they took that from me. They took my money, or they took this, or they took that from my car, or they took my sweater, whatever it may be, or they took my diamond off the, off the bureau. It was, they were the only ones in the house at the time, so I knew it was them because it was there when they, before they came. And unforgiveness is quick to tell us why we should not forgive why we should not forgive someone. That person doesn't deserve to be forgiven for what they did. <laughs> Other degrees of offenses? Other degrees of sins? No. Sin is a sin. If someone lies to you, it's just as worse as it same as if they stole from you or did anything else. They hurt you. So you still have to dish out the same amount of forgiveness to that person no matter what they've done. Now, that doesn't mean that that person gets off scot-free either. You know, someone comes and shoots your brother and kills them. You, 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 in your heart, you have to forgive them but they're going to pay the penalty for the rest of their life in a, in a penitentiary somewhere. It's called accountability and responsibility for your actions. Sometimes people need to understand that. They think just because you become a Christian that they can do whatever they did and not bring restitution. Sometimes this restitution is needed. Amen? I'm not going to go to the next slide, but next, next week we're going to be talking about bitterness as a root and uh, some of the things that happen with that and then the antidote to bitterness. So we'll be talking about that next week. It's already 8.35, and I don't, I don't want to. But see how fast the time is going? Are you enjoying this? Amen. Good. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you. We praise you, God. We ask you, Lord, that you continue to move upon our hearts and lives. and Father, those that are watching by Facebook, God, that you will do a deep healing in their spirit, soul, and body. And Father, that, Lord, as we come to the, hear the truth of your word and how much you love us, how much you care about us, that, Lord, you're willing to come back for us and take us where you are. Help us to 
Think on those things and dwell on those things. Begin to discipline our hearts and our minds, Father, so that we can be in perfect peace. Help us to know when the enemy throws in the thoughts to have discernment, whether it's our own thinking, the devil's thinking, or if you're implanting a thought into our minds. Help us to be able to discern between the three of them. And help us not to give in when the enemy lies to us. To be strong in the Lord and the power of your might, Lord. Give us traveling mercies as we go and keep us safe. In Jesus' name, amen. Fellowship with one another before you leave.